we have a little bit of a luxury now. Um, and that luxury is Katrin. Mm. Um, Katrin, I mean, everybody knows who she is, what she stands for. Um, she was the Spirit of the Games Award winner last year. She is the epitome of what we're looking for. Well, the second pillar that this thing has been built upon is Cole mm. Sager. Another Spirit of the Games Award winner who seems to do everything the right way and um, has all – like those two really help to create the foundation. And as you said, like you – one person could come in and destroy – yeah, but at the same time, like if you have a strong enough locker mm. room, you could take some risks and some flyers on some people. Yeah. We're not we're not doing that yet. So uh, like, that's a – that is a – it is a down the road. We recognize that we don't need to get everyone to fit the perfect mold. We don't need to do that. But it's kind of like in entrepreneurship, like the first 15 hires are kind of crucial to long-term success. We're being very intentional with this team that we've created now. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. Today we are going to dive back into our conversation we started last episode on been what you've called what what we're calling the Comp Train Academy. Um, so, folks, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, I do recommend that. Um, we're going to try to pivot a little bit the conversation, but I think there's a lot of context in last episode that will be helpful for uh, for you. So, go back listen to that one before you jump into this one. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about in this episode is we, we spent a lot of time in the last episode talking about the business Comp Train. Uh, the games itself, sort of why the why now is maybe the right time to be doing this kind of thing. Um, and I don't want to skip over the the some of the things you said about the environment that you're trying to build um, and the people you're trying to kind of surround yourself with. So that's what I'd like to talk to you today about, which is really the maybe I don't know what else to call it other than the the, the athlete experience maybe of this of the Comp Train Academy. Cool. And I want to start yeah, first with a question. That we hit on a little bit in a two minute drill recently. Somebody somebody had asked this question about um, how are you going to make sure that having these multiple game athletes in the same place at the same time aren't actually a detriment to their own individual training? Right. We've talked a lot about in the past um, uh, what happens if you know what happens if two games athletes are constantly training with each other. Well, so, what might ac accidentally happen is that they end up competing every day. That they're not training. That they're not practicing. But because I've got, you know, Johnny next to me and he and I are always pushing each other, suddenly every day, every training session is a race, right? And so that to me is the first question for you is, I know we're at the beginning of this, but now that you've got these athletes in the same place at the same time, how are you starting to think about the necessary balance of, of making sure that individual needs are met, but also that you're taking advantage of the fact that they're now surrounded by two, three, five, six other games athletes? where how are you going to start to play with that balance yeah it's uh it's balance it's a little bit of uh it's a it's a it's like fire mm. right it's a, it could be a fire could be this like incredible amazing resource that changes humanity or it could burn the freaking <laughs> house down it's super yeah. dangerous so you got to make sure you tend to the fire very very carefully and not give gas to the wrong aspects of it um it's a great question, Pat, and it's uh, um, something I we've thought a lot about, and it's one of the things that we were most um, curious how it was going to play out, um, but it's the thing I've given the most attention mm -hmm. to. I believe that there's a real benefit when this can be done correctly, uh, a, a massive benefit. It's not just about like they push each other every day. It's honestly about... What greater thing is there in the world? I mean, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like after you have like, after you can breathe, after you have like a place, a comfortable place to sleep, the next thing you want is to belong to something. These guys are individuals. Like what do they belong to yep. really? What we're giving them is an opportunity to belong to this team. And I use that word like specifically, it's, we are a team. Now that doesn't just happen. 
Um, it starts first and foremost with the athletes that we recruit um, and we vet them and we make sure that they're going to be a good fit. Um, we look for certain temperaments and characteristics and um, the right people. And that's not to say that they're all the same. They're very, very different. Like Chandler is very different than mm-hmm. Sam and um, Sam is very different than Katrin and Katrin is very different than Cole and so on. Um, but they all work together really, really well. We've been doing this for uh, a little over a month, six weeks or so. Could it still go awry? Yeah, I'm sure it can. And when that happens, as long as we've instilled the right, you know, I'm trying trying not to to use the buzzwords, but it's impossible not to. We have to lay out truly what is important to us. That's called values. It's, you know, and the buzzword is core values. And I hate even using that word now, but like, but like, who are we? What do we believe in? Now, if you believe in your performance above all else, this probably might not be the place for you. If um, you believe in some other things, this may or may not be the place for you. If you believe in the things that we espouse, then this place definitely is for you. And then from there is making expectations incredibly clear at the onset. So I'll give a real world example of this. Um, and all of I, these conversations had were had with everybody. So none of this is behind the scenes whatsoever. It's just um, one of our um, – we have um, Emma. Emma is a developmental athlete. Um, so she is training with the elite athletes. There was some conflict about whether, uh, who gets to use what equipment when totally makes sense. Like we're going to run up against those things. If we don't navigate that with total transparency and total clarity, it leads to this weird kind of like rumors talking about each other, these weird kind of like feelings, like it escalates really quickly. Instead, We made sure that people understood how to navigate these things, which is this dichotomy we have between two principles, never whine, never complain, never make excuses. That is one of our principles. It's like, if you do that, you are a victim. Victims complain, victims whine, victims make excuses. That is the lowest level of mindset. We are so far from there. That is almost in direct opposition to this other principle we have, which is always be communicating. Like if we're always communicating and we're communi- we need to communicate about things that issues and potential things that we, we need to mitigate, how the hell do we do that without complaining? Like I have a problem. I'm supposed to be communicating with it, but I'm never supposed to want to complain. Like coach, like, like this is a crappy <laughs> place to be. So we, we, set, we set it up the right way and we let people know. If you have a problem with another person on this team, another coach, another uh, athlete, a manager, another employee of our team, feel free to socialize that with somebody else. Feel free to go to a peer and say, I'm having this problem with this person. But there's two things that have to happen when you do that. The first one is you have to enter that conversation with a solution-oriented mindset. Meaning you don't go there and go, um, um, that athlete XYZ, she's such a bitch, I can't believe she blah, 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 blah. That's not solving any problems. That's not doing any good for anybody. So it has to be solution-oriented, meaning you go to the person's, a person and you're like, hey, I'm having a, um, an issue with her. How do you think I should navigate this? What do you think would be the appropriate thing to say? Should I talk to Ben about this? Where do you think the next steps are for me? What would you do if you were in this situation? Solution oriented. Then the next piece of that principle, the step two, is the next one has to be the conversation with that person. The person you're having the issue with. Because if you then go and socialize that with a two, three, four, five other people, All you're doing is spinning up a rumor mill and you're not moving forward with a solution. So that's the way we navigate between two principles of always be communicating and never whine, never complain, never make excuses by having a conversation that is solution oriented and then having the hard conversation with the actual person. This is exactly what happened when Emma, there was an issue with Emma's uh, using equipment and it was 
no big deal. And everyone's totally up to snuff and everyone feels so much better for it. And we're in such a better place, literally hours afterwards, not this weird feeling. That's what strips teams away. And it's those small things. So the second aspect of it is being really intentional about what it means to be on a team. And you're no longer just an individual. Yes, you compete in an individual sport, but we are training as a team. We have to understand those two differences. You are competing as an individual. You are training as a team. And if we're training as a team, I stole something from Doc Rivers, the former coach of the Celtics turned uh, LA Clippers. He might be somewhere else now. Um, But when he was with the Celtics and in the middle of the season, he got three superstars. He had Paul Pierce. All of a sudden, Ray Allen comes on and Kevin Garnett comes on. Three superstars. How in the world are you going to take three alpha males who want the ball, who want to be the leader, who want to be in the voice in the locker room? How do you get them to work together? It's as simple as recognize that you're a team. So what he used was a word called Ubuntu, which is South African. And Ubuntu is what res- it's what reunited South Africa. It's what a Desmond um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela used to bring the country back together from apartheid. And the word means I cannot. It has no direct correlation to English, but essentially what it means is it's the essence of humanity, which means I cannot be all I can be unless you are everything that you can be. If you are not everything you can possibly be, I will not reach my potential. So I can only be my best by helping you become your best. When we do that, we truly create a team. And what we're looking for is not, did I beat that person in the workout? Not, but like it's true, authentic cheering for the other person because they want them to get more muscle ups. Because if they do, it'll push them in the long run. The third part is recognizing the true measures of success we're shooting for, which if you define that as places on the leaderboard, that's a very finite game. We're not playing the finite game. Simon Sinek stuff, we're playing the infinite game. So we define success very differently. When you combine those three things, laying out values and principles, so basically like who are you? What do you belong to? We're going to lay out the actions and decisions and behaviors that we're looking for ahead of time through our values and our principles. Then from there, these overarching themes about what does it mean to be on a team. After I introduced, we're on week five of this now. I meet with them every single day for a half hour. Literally after their morning session, I meet with them for a half hour and we watch videos, we read books, we talk, we do workshops every day, uh, every training day, I should say. So um, very, very intentional about how we're creating a team. And then from there is understanding the true metrics of success we're shooting for. And when you define those, that kind of three-headed monster, that trilogy, um, all of a sudden all the little things, the bickering stuff and the, 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 the bad side that might come out of the competitive cauldron dissipates. Because you can now create the ultimate competitive cauldron that is a team. It's much like uh, I've, so, I've, I've borrowed, stolen, whatever you want to call <laughs> some of this from Ant, Ants and Dorrance as well. So Ants and Dorrance is the um, girls soccer coach of North Carolina that's won 22 national championships. Pause. Let that sink in. 22 national championships. Tom Brady has been to 10 Super Bowls and won seven. And he is the greatest by so far. Ants and Dorrance has won 22 in arguably the most competitive female sport in college athletics, soccer. Um, his whole ethos is a competitive cauldron, is just like this place where they push each other so hard, uh, it forges steel. And these girls are just monsters. You have to be very, as much as we're talking about like, monsters and competitive cauldron and steel and fire and aggressiveness. It has to be handled with white gloves. Like you have to be very intentional behind the curtain, right? You have to make sure that you're setting it up. And I'm saying you have to be sure. I don't know. Like I'm doing this for the first time. So I'm, this is what I'm saying. When I say like, you have to be sure, this is what I'm selling myself. 
I have to be sure that I'm doing this very intentionally. I have to, I'm not saying this is the best way to do this. I have no idea if this is going to work, but it's, it's through the thought that I've given it is the way that I feel like is the way that's going to give us the most success. I look forward to talking about this in like two years and seeing what, you know, seeing what you actually learned. And I'm, and I'm like, I can't believe that's the way I was thinking about Um, it. I like laugh, ha ha, chuckle, chuckle. Um, Yeah. What the what, one thing that strikes me as important, and, and we've talked about it a little bit, but it's the, everything you just said. I think the most important thing that you hinted at a little bit, and I wonder if we can unpack it, is putting the right people into that environment that you're being intentional about. You could be as intentional and all of that could be perfect, right? That everything that you just talked about, but you put the wrong person into it and it'll it'll throw a wrench in it. And so I wonder if you can't maybe talk to us about maybe even just the history of how you've picked athletes to work with, but how do you pick athletes to work with? How do you say there are lots of athletes who are amazing athletes who aren't part of this, right? Who are amazing athletes in the sense of like, they perform really well. What is the criteria? If there is a criteria for you to say yes to one person and no, thank you to another person. If you have that, if you have a criteria, if it's not a gut feeling, yeah, I would love to say it's all one sided. It's I pick who it is, but part of it is the people that want to be mm. a part of it. Like that's just that's just like the obvious. Like there are great athletes out there that don't want to be a part of this, and that's totally fine. The ones that do want to be a part of it, though, we have to make sure that they are the right fit. So um, we have a little bit of a luxury now, um, and that luxury is Katrin. Mm. Um, Katrin. I mean, everybody knows who she is, what she stands for. Um, she was the Spirit of the Games Award winner last year. She is the epitome of what we're looking for. Well, the second pillar that this thing has been built upon is Cole Sager, another Spirit of the Games Award winner who seems to do everything the right way and um, has all – like those two really help to create the foundation. And as you said, like you – one person could come in and destroy. Yeah. But at the same time, like if you have a strong enough locker Mm. room, you could take some risks and some flyers on some people. We're not, we're not doing that yet. So uh, that's a, that is a, it is a down the road. We recognize that we don't need to get everyone to fit the perfect mold. We don't need to do that. But it's kind of like in entrepreneurship, like the first 15 hires are kind of crucial to the long-term success. We're being very intentional with this team that we've created now. So when we think about the athletes that we have, um, Katrin, Cole, Amanda is ama- like, talk about sliding right in, like Amanda, um, Sam was like when he, so, and everyone came and joined us at a different time. So it's like they, and when they come in, it's kind of like, oh, I wonder how it's going to fit. And they slide in. It's like, <laughs> ah, that's just amazing. Everyone fits there. Um, and then, and Chandler, like everyone has, um, a certain like-mindedness, but not in terms of like the way that they approach things, not group think, not, um, not from like a, um, a similarity in like a, uh, a cultural t- aspect or anything like that. It's the, the similarity and the number one thing I think you have to have to be able to make this thing work. The number one is, um, curiosity. You have to be curious about how to get better. Because if you think you've got it all figured out, um, like, what are we doing here? Like, you can't, couldn't you do this in your garage? Like, couldn't you do this in your affiliate? That's the number one thing is like, I'm here because I want to improve. If you're not curious, and call it a growth mindset, fixed mindset, that sort of thing. The opposite to me of curious is like, um, uh, I'm, I'm struggling on the word, but it's like where you um, are looking to check. You want to make sure that you, you, the boxes have been checked, that you're good enough, that you help me out with that word. Uh, it's on, I, I don't know why I'm struggling with that. Um, you're looking to make sure, like the opposite of this curiosity thing is like, how do I get better? What are they doing? How do, what can I learn from them? The other way is that is like everything becomes pass fail, where it's like, I'm either going to beat them today or I'm going to lose to them today. And you're going to destroy yourself if that is who you are at the center of your being. So that's the one thing that we kind of search out above and beyond all that um, from a character standpoint. 
Then the other ones are like, like kind of, I call them like permission to play a little bit. It's like, you got to work hard. Like, but at our level, everyone works hard, but there's this little other thing. And it, it, to me, it, it spurs from the curiosity aspect is like, um, people work hard, but a lot of times they only, they don't work hard on things that they don't like <laughs> right. to do. Yeah. Right. And they, even at the highest level, this shows up a lot, you know, even in basketball, like, you know, people that are good at three point shooting, like to go to the, and shoot three pointers. They, they don't like um, working on boxing out somebody and getting rebounds. You know, like in our sport, you're rewarded for how good at you are at what you suck at. Like, so there's that level of it is like this humility aspect of like with this willingness to work hard on the things that you're not good at, not just willingness to go dark in the things that you, you know, oh my gosh, he's not scared of throwing around the big weights. Yeah, because he he's the strongest athlete in the field. Right. Oh my gosh, she's not scared of this 10K run. Yeah, because she has the best endurance in the field. Like, you know, that type of stuff. Flip the script on those. So um, from there, the next thing that we look at is um, some like um, history, skill set, like how good are they? That matters to us, mm -hmm. talent. Um, but it's more potential than it is talent. And one of the ways that we judge that is um, – body shape and sizes there's a, there's a you know if you're it can be ridiculous not to right if you're looking for a center for your basketball team it would be kind of ridiculous to you know go to the kentucky derby and scout there for the jockeys yeah it's like you need somebody that's over six foot ten like you, like that's the price of admission like that's just what happens um so there's this certain kind of framework that we're looking for um and there's some specifics inside of that but I'll kind of hold those cl close to the vest. Got it. Um, I have some practical questions. Maybe we can. I, I don't know how. I don't know how much of this you you want to talk about. Just again, keeping some things close close to the chest. But I can I can imagine some questions that folks are having, which is around these these elite athletes that you've gathered there. Things like, and I'll I'll say broader than you. Be as specific as you want. But things like, are they under contract? Are you paying them? Do they pay their own? expenses out to the games now how do you how do you how do they deal with sponsorships now is that part of the deal um do you pay for their housing like all of these like they're they're logistical things yes but they're in, i imagine they're incredibly important logistical things to figure out how to do well how have you guys navigated some of those maybe more boring things but important things yeah um so yeah we are so these elite level athletes um, I'm really proud to say that I think that we're the first um, competitive program that is compensating our athletes. So um, some you actually have to pay to get the programming. Um, for the elite athletes, we are compensating them as brand ambassadors. And actually, we've gone so far as it's kind of weird talking about this publicly, but I don't know why. I don't, in my mind, I'm like, should I not be talking about this? But <laughs> um, yeah, we're doing some really cool stuff for them. We put them on our payroll so they get all of our health benefits. We pay 80% of their health. We give them, they're on our 401k. They have a, they have a retirement plan. Um, we're giving them housing. Um, yeah, we're doing um, some cool stuff for those guys. Now that's reserved for the, you know, right now we have five. We'd like to get six, three guys, three girls. Um, so th that's reserved for them. Then we have a dev team, which we're creating, which yeah. we talked about in the last episode. Those people will not be compensated. Um, they will. We will not put them. They're just going to be here. They're not going to pay to be here. Um, but we will give them coaching. We will give them programming. We'll give them the training and um, access to all of the resources that we've compiled. But they will not be compensated athletes. Under that will be our youth development um, program academy, and those people will pay to be a part of this, much like they would if you were to go to any development program. And we'll give scholarships to the appropriate people and. Um, but that's the way it's kind of structured. So one end of one end feeds the other end. So the Academy youth feeds the ability to pay the pros, which is the way most of these academies are set up. Um, that's a really good segue into what I want to talk about next. We talked about in the last episode, the, um, I don't remember if you, if you labeled this over to me, but the tiers, right? The, the elite, as you just mentioned, dev team, and then the youth Academy or the youth program. Can you um, can you talk a little bit about? I think we have a good sense of how the elite team will be built. 
how will the dev team be built? How are you thinking about building that? Uh, especially given that nothing like that really exists now. There isn't a place you can go and say, okay, what are the neck? You know, what is the what, where's the future of the games? You'd have to literally look at the open and say, where are the 19 year olds or where are the 20 year olds or where are the 17 year olds, right? Is that what you're doing? Or like, what kind of mechanisms can you start to put in place to be able to identify and then invite those those athletes to, to join the dev team? Um, yeah, that's one way you can do it. Yeah, there and there's there's a, there's a few others as well. Um, but you, what we're we'll, we'll twofold. There will be um, an application process, so you could apply to become a part of this. Just like you, uh, it's college, right? Where where it's a think of a D one sports team. You could walk on, so you could just start training at CF and E, and all of a sudden we're like, oh my god, dude, you're a freak. You should come train with us a little bit, and then you become a part of the dev team. You could apply to be a part of the team. Um, or we could do it through recruiting processes as well. And we will be doing, uh, we'll actively recruit as well. I don't know what percentage is going to come yeah. from where, because we haven't done it yet. So in the beginning, maybe it's um, 90% recruiting, or maybe it's the opposite. I don't know. Maybe it's 90% people just showing up at our door. We don't really quite know what that is yet. And the reason we don't know yet is because we're purposely not, that's a year or two away. We purposely don't want to get ahead of our, you know, get over our skis. We, um, we want to be able to make sure that we're doing what we're doing well first, and then we'll de- build the developmental program. So we only have that one um, in-house athlete in Emma right now. Um, but yeah, it's going to be um, um, super exciting to be able to get these, you know, these different age groups and these different um, abilities in here. And the, the biggest prerequisite will again be the same thing is like, are you the right fit? Um, from a character standpoint, um, and then do you have potential? Like, do we see that you could be, um, be great, not good. Like we, we want to get people to be on the podium. Like this isn't about getting to the games. Like we want, um, it's, it's not about, uh, getting people to the Olympics. It's about gold, you know, gold, silver, bronze medals. Yeah. And when you think about the, and I, and I, I, let's reiterate that this is a couple years out, so people don't send me messages about how to get on the dev team because I don't know yet, because um, you don't know yet. <laughs> but thinking about when when you're going to have the 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 bandwidth to to actually execute on this, thinking about like maybe it's a 15, 16 year old now. Let's just say maybe 17 year old now. What what should they be doing? Where should they be thinking about focusing in order to set themselves up for that? When you say. If you're interested in the dev team, email us here and here's the thing. What should they be doing now in the next year, say, to make sure that they are the right person for this this idea when this idea becomes a little bit uh, uh, closer to, to fruition? Yeah, so um, the number one would be um, working on the three peaks of like the, the three mm-hmm. pillars. And that is working on your absolute strength and that's the number one we, you need to be strong in our sport and strength takes years so what we found is that it's it's not great for an athlete to be introduced to us at 26 years old and not be strong because you don't have the opportunity to get them strong um, even an athlete that's entering at um, 23 20 there's so much maybe potentially other stuff they need to work on maybe it's swimming or something else um, but in that youth development time, that's the time to get strong. So that would be the number one. Number two would be skills, meaning can you walk on your hands really well? Can you um, do freestanding handstand pushups? Can you do pistols and higher level gymnastics stuff? Do you have 30 unbroken muscles for a guy and 20 for a girl? Um, you know, that aspect of gymnastics. And then the next one would be last on the list, and it wouldn't matter that much to me, but um, it'd be nice to see some conditioning mm-hmm. pieces. You know, um, if those athletes have those numbers, but have a ten-minute mile, you know, and they can do back handsprings and um, you know snatch, you know, uh, you know, two hundred and five pounds for girls and three hundred and fifteen for guys. I'm not that concerned about their conditioning at age 15. You know, that can, we can work on that. Um, so that's what I would look at first and foremost is those kind of two ends of the spectrum. Um, and the third kind of down the tier would be like, all right, what's your mile time? What's your 5K? 
what's your fight gone bad, stuff like that. We've we've talked about in the past the the balance or the benefit of being one versus the other as it relates to being a generalist and a specialist, specific, especially or specifically this age range. With this idea, though, with this dev team, would it make sense in your yeah. mind, at least to a degree, for a 15, 16, 17-year-old now looking at this as like, this is what I want to do in a year or two years, mm. to start to specialize? Or do you still think that, and I remember when we talked about it, one of the argument I think was, now now that age is not the time to be a, to be a specialist in the sport of CrossFit. Is that changing? Does it have to change in order for a youth program, a, a dev team graduating up into the elite in order for that kind of trajectory to work? Do we need to start seeing kids specialize at 15, 16, 17? No. And I'm so glad you brought that up. In fact, one of the aspects of the youth academy when they're here with us is that they will be mandated to play a sport outside of the academy for mm-hmm. one season. And it has to be a team sport because I don't want you to go and do gymnastics or swimming or track and field and just pre- pretending that you're you're actually training for CrossFit. Yeah. Like, like I want you to join a team sport with a ball, <laughs> like, or a puck or something like, you know, you get it. Um, Cause I think that there's so much that's inherent in that team aspect and so much inherent in that, um, the, the broad spectrum and not the specialist. At age 18, 19, I'm, that's no longer the mm-hmm. case. At that point, it no, but it's not like, you know, like in a uh, range, the book range and all these people, all the people that have made these arguments, they're not talking about Roger Federer continuing right. <laughs> to go play pond, right. ho- pond hockey three days a week while he's on the tour. That's not what's happening. So at age 17, 18, I'd like to see the specialization start happening, but certainly not before that. At age 16 and below, they should be playing at least one team sport. And if they wanted to and they had a weakness, I would actually like to say the person did have a um, – swimming was a weakness. I, you, yes, you can do um, soccer in the fall and you can do swim team in the winter. Is this so weird that s- swimming is a winter sport? I guess it's in the yeah. pools. That's why. So it doesn't really matter. But anyway um, – you could do a, an individual sport as well to work on it. What a great way to work on that weakness for a season. And we would seriously encourage, and you know, slash I already said mandate um, the, the additional sports outside of what we're doing. Um, and then you, so the, the way it would look like for the youth people is um, three seasons out of four, they'd be with us before school and after school. I'm sorry, um, um, four, uh, yeah, three seasons out of four before school and after school. And then one season, they'd be with before school, but training with the other team after school. I'm really curious about your, specifically your role in all of this. We've talked a little bit about um, you certainly as as the visionary there at CompTrain, right? And, and bringing in a CEO to, to handle a lot of the execution on maybe whatever that vision might be. What, and then again, I know we're five, six weeks into this, so you're probably still figuring it out, but what does... What do you imagine your life, your role looking like within this? Like, are you all five of those are eventually six games athletes? Are you their coach? Are you doing their programming? You're there for every one of their sessions. Like that's your life now. Or what do you like? How do you imagine this evolving personally as you go forward, as you learn more, as you as you iterate on this? So um, it's one of the the challenges that we've had this year more so than any other because um, we were expecting to have one other athlete here beyond besides yeah. Katrin. And in that case, like I could have just done my normal MO, what I do have done for the last 10 years. Um, because we had every athlete, all these athletes move here, you know, um, minus Cole. I, I, I that's, that's such a broken <laughs> promise. Like come yeah. here and, and I, so, um, right now I am the head coach of comp train. Uh, I coach them, um, through both of their sessions every day. Um, everyone does two sessions and, um, we also have assistant coaches, which are there. Every assistant coach has two coaches. Um, I would imagine in the future. Um, so, um, that I am truly just the, it's so like, I'm still Catron's coach. Um, I'm still the one that works with Cole. Um, I'm working mostly with Chandler and so on, but I do envision a future where every athlete that comes in, um, is on a little sub team with another coach and it's like one or two or three, you know, 
probably maximum two, a guy and a girl. And it works out well that way. So right now, like um, in-house, I have Katrin and Chandler and Harry is working with Amanda and Sam. Um, But we have coaches meetings once a week where we lay out the entirety of the next week. And um, Dan is working with our developmental athlete, Emma. And we also have Tori, which helps us with our morning model sessions and is with us a few times in the afternoon. So we actually have four coaches for these four athletes, mm-hmm. which is phenomenal. Um, on d- in addition to that, we have endurance coaches and sports psychologists and nutritionists and other stuff. But these are the people that are on boots on the ground every single day. Um, and I do envision my role um, becoming farther and farther removed from – um, visionary aspect, if you want to yep. call it that, from like more the big picture and getting more entrenched into um, the academy yep. side of things. Yep. What from a from an athlete perspective, can you? What does this mean? This idea. Let's just let's just keep it to the idea, let alone the specifics of what, how you're going to execute it. What do you imagine this means for athletes in the sport of CrossFit? If this idea becomes real, more real, somebody else is going to try to do their own kind of flavor, their own kind of version of it. If you could look ahead, maybe two, five, 10 years, can you, do you, do you have a sense of like what this is going to mean for the individual athlete, the population of individual athletes when, when this is the kind of environment that the sport is uh, building around the, 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 the games or around whatever the event structure is? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not really, I don't, that's not the way my brain really operates. I'm not really thinking of it mm-hmm. that way. Um, cause in that four or five years, we're going to be thinking four or five mm-hmm. years out. So there's gonna be a new thing. Like I'm, we're going to be operating with a new deck of cards and there'll be different opportunities that allow us new avenues to pursue. So, um, let's say that like, other people start to – these things start to pop up and there's um, four or five of these around the world um, and they're all doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're you know creating uh, perennial top 10 games athletes and they have a feeder, sister coming in, feeder system coming in um, and they're sustainable and profitable and um, if that happens, awesome. What, then it becomes – that's the new status quo. So what's next for us? Because that if that happens, that's great because it's going to provide another thing for us. Just like, um, you know, in 2007, when no one was doing competitive programming at all, we started doing competitive programming. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, so um, I didn't know what was – then all of a sudden like people – like fast forward 10 years, more people are in the game and now this is on our horizon. And I think it's just kind of like – uh, if you're kind of always thinking out a little bit, I don't really, you know, if it's kind of more like we're, we're planning for, um, it just, it makes, I don't want to say today less importance, but th- we're, we're building for next, you know, it's always for the next better, the next mm-hmm. best. You, um, we'll start, we'll start wrapping this up, but you mentioned something as we were talking about, um, kind of the culture that you're trying to build there. Um, uh, and you mentioned the, the idea of success and defining success the right way. Can you maybe unpack a little bit as to what that means? And certainly it's something that we've talked about a lot, but I'm curious, what does it look like through the filter of a comp trainer, through the filter of this team of elite athletes? How are you defining success in a way that isn't the leaderboard, that isn't, well, how did we do at the games this year? We had three podiums. Okay, was that is that a success or is that a failure? What, is that, what does that look like and how are you guys starting to, to define that for yourselves? So I, I want the athletes to define that for themselves individually. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying this is what success looks for like us as a team. We have that from organizational, yep. uh, you know, a, a business standpoint, but that's not, that has nothing to do with the athletes. The athletes individually, I want them all to have their own metrics for success because what, what Katrin defines as success is not going to meet up with Sam's and Amanda's and so on. So the only thing I ask when we go through this exercise, and it's an, iter- it's an iteration that takes usually a few weeks. Um, the only thing I ask is that, it's in your control. Mm. You can control the outcome. 
Because if you can't control the outcome, like, and this is where specific like leaderboard, like if my goal is to run a sub four hour marathon, if that's your goal and you're like, that's it, it's going to do that or die. And you wake up and it's the Boston Marathon, which is run in April and you wake up and there's six inches of snow on the ground and a 30 mile an hour headwind and it's 20 or it's even worse. It's um, 34 degrees and raining and you were just hoping to crack four, four minutes. That's what all your training was leading up to. You're not running a four hour marathon that day. So I know what's going to happen to your performance that day because your goal, your extrinsic motivator is gone. The internal motivator isn't, doesn't exist. So we need to be able to do is own, take total ownership and responsibility and control over our own levels of success. Now, if you say that to me and it's, um, and you're an athlete of mine and you say it's, I really just want to be the best possible dad I can be. I'm cool with that. Like I'm cool with that. That's, I need to know that. And I, what we'll do is we'll create the parallels between what you're doing here on a daily basis, how that leads up to becoming the best possible dad. But I need to know that. Um, and what most people end up coming up with is some form of, um, you know, just doing uh, my very best to, um, you know, oh, it, to uh, live the life um, true to my values. You know, it's like, it always comes down to kind of like giving everything I have towards that which matters to me. Um, it, I, I don't have to give them any direction whatsoever. That's what it always comes to. And it's like, great. Now let's spend some time figuring out what those things are. You say it's family, faith, fitness. Let's dive into those. Okay, why is it family? Dot, dot, dot. Why is it faith? Dot, dot, dot. Why is it fitness? Dot, dot, dot. And they go, fitness. Well, it's because I use fitness to provide for my family. Well, so is it fitness then or is it family again? Huh, I don't know. Maybe it's not fitness. Maybe it is just the means to the ends and the ends of the family. Or no, maybe it is fitness. I don't feel my true self. I feel like I get, I feel most alive. I feel in a flow state. I feel so much, um, I feel like uh, I'm with my, one with the world when I'm extra. Okay, cool. Then it probably is fitness. Like, But let's not just throw these words up there and let them kind of be words. Like, we want to make sure that these things carry meaning. Mm-hmm. Love it. All right, my friend, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I'm so glad we were able to catch up on the Comp Train Academy. I cannot wait to watch. I cannot wait to have more conversations like this as we go, as you guys go, as you learn, uh, as you develop, as you evolve this idea. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, everybody out there listening. Um, thank you for your ratings and your reviews. We'll be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.